Daily Show. Live here with Kevin Mears. Good evening. And we're speaking tonight with George Lutz, the George Lutz, who was the basis and is the basis for the book, The Amity of Horror, lived in the house, fled from the house 28 days later, lived in the most haunted house in human history. I would say that's pretty accurate, don't you say, Kev? Or what? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you know, and I just apples thinking, to apples here. I mean, it's the truth. I was just thinking about it earlier today. And, as the, you know, it is definitely the most famous and probably the most haunted in all of U.S. history, if not the world. There aren't a lot of houses that come close to that degree of, t- of activity. No. Let alone worse. Now, with us on the line right now, I'm going to introduce Mr. John Zaffis. John Zaffis is the nephew of Ed Warren. John has been ghost busting and ghost hunting for over 28 years, and he's a direct blood descendant demonologist of Ed Warren. John, welcome. Hey, Lou. How you doing? Good. How are you doing? Okay. Well, I know this is this is going to be a first for you too. Yes, it is. <laughs> you know, so you know this is this is going to be interesting. Well, you got to remember, least. Lou, for the uh, past. Uh, 28 years that Amityville has existed, I've heard more about Amityville and more of the stories and more of the debunking of it than any uh, individual I could possibly think of. (laughs) So for me, it's a a great opportunity to finally get on the air and talk a little bit about it, and uh, it's a good thing. All right. Now, without any further ado, I'd like to welcome back George Lutz. Welcome, George. Hi, Lou. How are you? All right. Uh, now, uh, what I want to do... John. Hi, George. How you doing? I'm fine. How are you? Okay. No, I was just going to introduce him, but that's okay. <laughs> you, Hello, guys are, John. you guys are always a step ahead of me, I'll tell you. You're too slow, Luke. I'm telling you. <laughs> anyway. But uh, anyway, um, you George... You make me nervous when you say the George Lutz or... or... Words to them. Oh, all right, fine. I'll just call you Lee like everybody else. I don't Please. know. I'm just on the stand. <laughs> Ever since you called into the show that one time, I'm just like, uh, Mr. George Lutz, <laughs> you know? But anyway, Lee, um, if you could explain to the listening audience, as well as John, what exactly led up to you going into that house after you've purchased it and then fleeing the house 28 days later, could you could you possibly let everyone know exactly what happened there's probably a, a little bit of background i could give you that would help sure whatever you think is going to help um, even how the finances went for the house okay um kathy and i were married uh the previous july and we each owned a house and kathy had her three kids and we wanted a, a new house for the new marriage mm-hmm. so the idea was to sell both houses and if we could find something on the water where I wouldn't have to pay then the um, docking fees for my boat, and we would have that savings as well, then we would be financially way ahead of having the two keeping the two houses, or plus the rental for the boat and the travel back and forth and all the rest. So the idea was to go out and find a house that um, would suit us in as many ways as possible. Mm-hmm. Um, I recall that we looked at 40, 50, 60 homes. We spent most of the summer doing that. We put our homes up for sale. Kathy's home sold first. So she and the kids moved into my house in Deer Park. And eventually we bumped into the Amityville house. Um, Just I, the way I re- would describe it is by accident. The realtor said, I have something I want to show you. Um, she had shown us some other houses before that. And as soon as Kathy walked in the front door, she just had this smile like this was it. And that hadn't happened in all of the homes we had looked at, in all the different... And we looked at every price range possible as well uh, that we could conceivably figure out a way to work out financially. Mm -hmm. And when she had that smile on her face, it was like, okay, let's see if we can figure this one out. The house was on the market for $100,000. If I recall correctly, we made an offer of 80. It was accepted. 
I applied for a mortgage from one bank. Um, my credit was excellent. Um, we got approved immediately for a $60,000 mortgage. We had more than enough money to put the $20,000 cash down payment, and I think the closing costs with the insurance and the title fees and the attorneys and all the rest, and we bought some furniture from the estate, was another $4,000 or so. Um, we moved my boat over to the boathouse there, and we had I had just bought another boat that we hadn't even used yet. It was new for us. It was a uh, speedboat. Um, and we moved that in, and I built Harley-Davidson motorcycles as a hobby then, and we moved those over and my tools and what was left of the furniture from both of our homes, and we moved into this beautiful 4,000-square-foot home uh, on the water with a heated pool, full basement, boathouse, garage, and we thought we were home. When I told a friend of mine what house we were buying, um, he made me promise that I would get the house blessed. I didn't know what that was at the time. I was a non-practicing Methodist, if there is a proper way to describe that. Mm -hmm. And I asked Kathy what a house blessing was. She was Catholic, and she explained it to me. And the only priest I knew was a priest uh, by the name of Father Ralph Becker that um, was an ecclesiastical judge at the diocesan offices in Rockville Center, New York. He was uh, a therapist as well. He had a degree in, in therapy, and he was a judge and a lawyer in the Catholic Church court there. I didn't realize that he wasn't a, I guess what you could call a parish priest, where he went out and normally did house blessings, but I had met him when my previous marriage, which had lasted about six months, um, had been annulled, and I had been called in as a courtesy to for those proceedings, met him, and he and I had spoken from time to time over the phone um, since the time that I had met him. He hadn't met Kathy until the day that he came and showed up to see the house, um, to bless it. Um, I think they had spoken on the phone. Uh, at least once before he came over. He showed up while we were moving into the house. Um, we, The day that we moved, we had the trucks and trailers and van and all packed, and we um, went from our house in Deer Park to the closing and then went to the house to move in with all our stuff. Um, we were I was busy unloading a truck, and he came, and I waved, and in he went. Um, that was moving day, first day into the house. 28 days later, we left, and it wasn't like immediately there were problems with of every single kind or every kind of phenomenon. It was the kind of thing that got worse and more noticeable as time went on, and I have believed always since then that one of the ingredients to cause that, one of the things that, that made the place uninhabitable was the house blessing. Mm -hmm. um, and then subsequently, when Kathy and I believed that we needed to do it again ourselves, and what happened then when we went through the house uh, saying the Lord's Prayer and trying to rid the house of the noises and the odors and, and different things that have been happening. Uh, it got to the point where our last night in the house, um, was an experience for all five of us that individually, um, you would have thought we were each in five different houses when we recalled it and talked about it later to ourselves. We called Father Ray that day, and he asked us what we were still doing in the house, and that was a question that didn't occur to us to leave. I mean, everything of ours was there. It was our house. It was, we just wanted to figure out what was wrong with it and somehow 
get it fixed. We wanted him to come back and, and do another house blessing or whatever you do. Um, at that point, the, his words were so strange to us. What are you still doing in the house? And many times we had tried to call him and been unable to get a hold of him or we'd, we'd connect and then the phone would go dead or the, there would be a, um, a buzzing on the phone line. It would be interference of some kind. Um, we grabbed some changes of clothes and, and the dog, and we got in the van to leave. Um, and the car didn't start, and it was just like right out of a movie. Uh, we made the commitment to leave. We'd just basically gone running around trying to stay together um, to leave the house, and we got in the van, and it, didn't, it wouldn't start. And one of the things that I had done with the ignition system in that car was to put in uh, transistor ignition. It was a 74 um, Ford one-ton Super Duty van, and they, it had a button on it. You could go out and switch it. Uh, if you lifted the hood up, you could switch it back to conventional ignition, and I just got out of the car, went and pushed the button, and got back in the car and tried to start. It started right up, and we left, and, and we moved to Kathy's mom's house, and we did not go back to the house as a family. We didn't go back and get our things, or um, the kids never saw the house again. Um, we moved to, eventually moved to California on Mother's Day of that, later that year. Now, George, in, in the house, you, you, you describe knockings and bangings? Yes. Were these things that you could not explain? I mean, this is going to sound stupid, you know, granted of, of what went on, but these were things that you could not explain physically from, you know, the real world. These were these were something that you couldn't just explain, correct? Well, let me preface that. I don't think that you ask a question or you try to try understand something here that, that it's stupid, okay? Mm -hmm. I don't think that I can always explain it well enough for someone to understand it the way I mean it, so uh, maybe I'm the stupid one instead. The... I think what you're asking me is um, I mean, the kind of thing that we would be sitting in the dining room, in the kitchen rather, in the, um, there was a nook there where it had a table and a built-in kind of L-shape um, upholstered area and some chairs and we'd be sitting there with some friends and you would hear footsteps overhead on the second floor walking around mm -hmm. and you'd go upstairs and all the kids would be in their beds and you wouldn't have a way to... Um, explain to yourself where those footsteps came from. Mm -hmm. And that would happen, and you would try to dismiss it, and then you would have friends over, and you would be sitting there, and, and you would look at them, and you would ask them if they heard the, the footsteps also, and when they did, you would be partially relieved. You would think, okay, I'm not going crazy here. Um, they hear it too. And you'd go upstairs and take one of them with you, and they would see that the kids were asleep also. Mm -hmm. um, that kind of thing. That's the the beginnings of things that would just be so unnerving. You would just start making a list in your mind of this is wrong and this is wrong and this is wrong. Yeah, I didn't. I didn't mean it to sound like you know it's stupid. But what I meant. No, was no, I didn't just, take it that way. I didn't yeah, I, I mean, with all that you went through in that house, you know, I just want the listeners to understand that you know these things weren't just things that you were picking out of your mind and, and you were saying everything in the house was you know, supernatural or ghosts. I oh, mean, my goodness, no. Right. Um, the, it, it, and it's very slow. It's, it's a very difficult thing to explain to someone that hasn't experienced it, but it's a process that's slow. It's not like all of a sudden your first night is hell. Um, this, there were changes in all of us as time went on, the more time we spent there. And when we, when we left the house, we were not the same people that had moved in. We were... Um, Besides being frightened and, and disoriented and uh, without sleep and o way overtired and having had so many things confront us that we couldn't explain and didn't make any sense and, and we, we just uh, things that we had no idea could even go on. Um, we, we were not the same people as a family unit when we left there 28 days later. We, it was a, a change in all of us. It was so many things would happen um, to one of us. Uh, let me see if I can explain this, how I mean it. The, our perceptions individually 
we didn't have a chance to compare them very often while we were in the house. But after we left and we would talk about this, um, what Kathy thought was going on for me or what I thought was going on from her was really quite different than um, what really was. Mm -hmm. So there was a sense of confusion that kind of moved in with us uh, throughout this time, too. Um, did the house have some kind of a, of a certain personality to it, did you notice, after after a while? One of the things that you notice right away was the deadness of sound in the house. There was no resonance. Um, you could be on the front porch, and the sun would be out, and you would look outside, and you'd see a car drive past, but you wouldn't hear it. The outside outside noises didn't penetrate into the house. And, uh, for example, the last night we were in the house, we, um, we knew that there was a terrible, terrific storm going on outside. Mm -hmm. And yet the Weather Bureau, whatever, afterwards, um, people checked and said there was no such thing. Well, for us, in the house, that was going on outside. We don't really care what the Weather Bureau had to say about it later or... Even what the neighbors experienced for us, there was a terrible storm going on outside. So, in other words, you looked out the window and it was raining. And the, no, the, the wind and the, the noise from that, that did come through the windows. That okay. you did hear. Okay. Okay. That was, that was a time when that was very, 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 very strong. Um, prior to that, no, that wasn't the kind of thing. That was unusual. But it was so memorable. It was such a strong, um, indelible kind of memory. And so when Anson did the book from the tapes that Kathy and I did, um, just trying to undo this when we were talking about it, um, after we were in Kathy's mom's house, we just sat down and did a series of, of about 26 cassette tapes just talking about this. And then um, Anson, we, when we eventually met him and, and he agreed to try to write a book, uh, he had a very difficult job of putting together a, any kind of a book from those tapes. For, nothing was chronological. It was skip, we skipped all around. The, our language wasn't certainly wasn't the best. We were drinking at times when we were doing those recordings. Mm -hmm. um, by the time I left the house, I was drinking pretty heavily, without a doubt. No, oh, I'd probably be doing the same thing. <laughs> and I did that. for a number of years after that. Um, mm -hmm. The. The confusion that set in, and that, that's the point I was really trying to make. There was it was a slow, it was a progressive thing, and I think it, it, the house I considered it when years later when I look back uh, at the time I considered the house being very patient. It was willing to wait, um, but when we went around blessing the house again, it, it really got it, that got it kind of upset that it didn't like that. Now, John, I, I know you're you're soaking this in. You got to be if you're like me. John, do you have any questions for George? Um, no, not really. I'm I'm listening to everything that uh, George is explaining, and listening to all the details. And Lou, know, you know as well as I do, to listen to what George is telling you, and being involved with the research not only uh, from the Lutz's type of case, but how many other cases over the years it's the same type of scenario with uh, listening to George talking about trying to explain the, uh, the tappings and the wrappings that it starts out very light and then it escalates as time goes on. Mm -hmm. This is very, very classic with your personality changes uh, when everybody starts to go through all these types of withdrawals their personalities totally change. This is very, very characteristic when you're dealing with the demonic in these types of homes. So the amount of information that George is actually explaining from a first hand is very, very good. And not only that, it's something that I've heard thousands and thousands of times before from other people. So it's good to hear it from George firsthand. Now, um, George, can we take a call? Oh, sure. Okay. You're on the Lou Gentilly Show. Hello? Hi, I'm sorry. Are you about to leave comments? Uh, we're actually on the air right now. Would you like to talk to George Lutz? I'm sure. I would love to. Thank you. He's on. He's 
She's waiting for you to answer your question. Yell at me so I can hear you, please. Oh, hi, George. Uh, my hi. name is Marcy Warren. I'm sorry, I find it a little hard to hear you. Um, I just had a comment. I just wanted to say that um, I really have a lot of admiration for you, and I can't even imagine what it must have been like to go through all this stuff. And I just think you're a really strong person, and <clears throat> I hope things are going better for you now. And uh, just um, I hope you're at peace. <laughs> That's very kind of you. Thank you. That has happened. Okay. Hi, Marcy. It's nice to finally talk to you. Hi there. It's John Zappas. <laughs> oh, hi, John. How are you? <laughs> I'm sorry. I thought I was talking to George. <laughs> no, you're, you are. George is there as well as John. Oh, hi. I'm sorry. I find it so hard to hear you guys. Um, yeah, John, I think I actually emailed you a couple of days ago, and you gave me the info to come here and everything. Right. Um, yeah, I just wanted to say to George, though, I really admire him and Kathy for going through what they did and coming on here today and just revealing their story basically to the world. It just, you know, it's really something. And I'm just glad that they're good now or hoping that they are. And Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, I guess that's all I really have to say. <laughs> all right. Thanks for the call, dear. Okay. Thank all you. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. I don't know what to say to such a thing. I don't, I don't think that what we went through was admirable in any way. Um, well, I think they were. I, I appreciate they what, she, you, what she's saying, but the, the the hardest thing was to decide whether or not to go public with this, whether to even ever talk about it mm -hmm. um, publicly. You see, there's the thing that does is worthy of admiration, though. I think you were willing to go out in the public with it in a time where these stories, as you well know, were not quite as popular and in vogue as they are today but you were still willing to tell the truth and continue to tell the truth well i think if we knew what we were going to go through for the next 25 years when we made that decision no we wouldn't have well yeah i can understand that i think we would have been cowards about that part hmm. all right i got to take a short break and uh when we return to the lucha and tilly show i'll be speaking more with tonight's guest George Lutz, and uh, we are on the line with John Zaffis and George Lutz, and we're talking about the Amityville Horror from the person who experienced the Amityville Horror at 112 Ocean Avenue, Lee Lutz. Lee, you there? Yes, I am. Okay. Uh, Lee, we're going to take a phone call in one second here. You're on the Lou Gentilly Show. What's your question for Mr. Lutz? Hi, Mr. Lutz. Um, I have a question. I'm... Um, while you were in the house, did you ever see actual actual entities walking around? Not like most people would think of, um, like seeing another person walk around. You would, in your peripheral vision, you would see something move and you would look there and there would be nothing there. And there would be times when you were sure that someone else was there in the room with you. But you wouldn't see it. I was always very grateful I didn't. Hmm. Any other questions? Uh, yeah, I have one more question for um, for John Saffis. Sure, go um, My mom always tells me um, when I see, like, someone using the Ouija board on TV, I have to watch it because, um, um, like, spirits or something can invade your house. Is, is there truth in that? Yes, there is. It's not actually the Ouija board. It would be the people that are using the Ouija board. Uh, that's just a piece of cardboard. But with that, it is opening up the doors for the spirits to be able to come through. So uh, do I endorse the Ouija board? No. It's a, a, a type of situation that can bring things in. Does it happen all the time? No. But I've worked on a lot of cases where a lot of people have told me they were playing with the Ouija board and they didn't believe it was doing anything or helping, you know, any way to be able to bring spirits in because they didn't believe them. And I'll always ask these people afterwards, do you believe it now? And they'll say, yeah, John, I do. But, I mean, just by watching uh, people use it on the TV, would that have any effect on your home? Uh, watching something on TV I don't really think can cause something. But what you have to remember, it has a lot to do with individuals, with their amount of sensitivity and the amount of recognition that would be given. If you have somebody that's very sensitive and they're seeing things like this, they can at some point, not always, but some point, could bring something in. Okay. All right. Thanks for the call. Thank you. All right. 
George, had uh, I got a, I got a question for you. Ha- have you guys, when you were in the house, did you ever come across a Ouija board or anything else like that? No. Okay. No. I had used one years earlier in in New Hampshire when I lived there. Um, it's my understanding that they're made in Salem, Massachusetts, and that each one is assigned a spirit, so to speak. Uh, well, they used to be made out there. Now, where are they made at, Kevin? Now, um, I think some of them still am, but are, but there are other. Fa- there's at least one other factory that makes them as well. Uh-huh. Yeah, there's a couple of different ones out there now. Lord only knows where they're all at. <laughs> George, go ahead, Kev. Um, out of curiosity, a lot of people in the chat are asking. I've been wondering myself. Have you had any? Did you have any experiences after you left the house? Yes. Could you talk about them, please? No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> hey, he told you. Okay, fair enough. Um, I, I kind of segue into this for you. Um, when Years later, in um, 1979, we were given the opportunity to take uh, some lie detector tests. And they were given by a fellow by the name of Chris Gugas, who was at that time considered the number two or number three man in the country to give such a thing. Um, among other things, he was accepted in California courts as a witness. Um, and he wrote a book called, uh, I'm sorry, I can't think of the name of it at the moment. I'll make sure that I do remember the name of it tomorrow. But I did bring the, I'm not at home right now, but I did bring the um, results of the test with me tonight. And one of the questions, I'll read it for you, that we wanted to have established in this, um, Kathy took a test and I took the test. Um, Silent Witness was the name of the program. Uh, It was the name of the book, I'm sorry. Um, After leaving Amityville, did you and Kathy both levitate at your mother-in-law's house? And we answered yes to that, and... uh, we passed the test um, without any questions about that. But the hard part was for people to understand that we were serious when we said that that, that happened. This was uh, within weeks of leaving the house in Amityville and, and moving in with Kathy's mom. And during that time, we were trying to get what we called at that point the house fixed. We were trying to find reputable people like the Warrens to come in and tell us what was wrong and tell us what needed to be done so we could move back in. Um, that's an example if that's the kind of thing you were looking for. Hmm. Does that answer your question, Kev? Yeah. Um, we're taking your calls, 888-777-8488. That's toll-free, 888-777-8488. To speak with George Lutz and John Zaffis. Um, John, does this sound classic with uh, a lot of the, the homes that you've encountered in your 28 years? And if, if it does, um, does it sound like it was accelerated for some reason? It, it's very, very classic. Uh, just listening to everything that George is explaining that transpired in that home, I, I've heard it time and time and time again from thousands of different people. So... For me to listen to it, I can understand it and I can comprehend what the entire family went through once they moved into their dream home. So, yeah, I can understand all of it. Classic, yes. Escalated today to the point where, thinking about it, when Father came in and he did the blessing, which was a very standard thing many years ago, Lou, where they you would automatically call your priest in to bless your home, everybody had that done. Mm-hmm. Today, it's almost not even heard of anymore. But at that point in time, it was a very good thing to do, to bring him in and have the blessing done. What I think is another good possibility is when George was explaining that when Kathy and him had walked through the house and they were doing a blessing, that also is a form of provoking. So that could have also cause things to exhilarate a little bit faster, and this could be why things escalated. George, did did things actually uh, occur more rapidly after these two, or I should say after you and Kathy 
uh, went through the house doing the blessing again and saying the few prayers. They got worse then. Um, yeah. See? They got Sometimes, worse very rapidly after that. Right. <clears throat> Sometimes when this is done, it, it, it brings it forward a, a lot more faster than when somebody won't do anything at all and they're just trying to piece together what the heck is going on in the house. Well, that's right. actually how that came about, that we did that. Uh, one of my tenants in my office building in, in New York, um, she had a friend who had had a similar experience years earlier, and he explained that he had had to go through the house himself um, and do a house blessing. And, and you just go into each room, you open a window slightly, you um, say the Lord's Prayer, and you command whatever's there to leave in the name of Jesus Christ. Um, we've been in the house at that point over two weeks, and that seemed to be a very reasonable kind of thing if that was going to work. Mm -hmm. we, you know, that was like, okay, great. If it worked for you, we'll try that. Mm -hmm. um, with, with, with the situation with the one person, what they had tried in their home, you know, uh, when they were doing that, might have been something that was very, very low level. Where with uh, George and Kathy, at that point, they weren't exactly sure what was there. And what it actually did was, you know, provoke it. And that's what brought it, you know, even stronger in at that point and made things start to really happen. Well, we were very grateful that he would even come over and sit there in the kitchen and listen to some of the things we would hear at night. Mm -hmm. And then he would explain from his point of view what he had experienced and, and his take on it. Um, that was an answer for the moment. Mm-hmm. Um, I guess, as it turns out, it was a good answer because it eventually got us out of there quicker. Right. Yeah. It got us out in one piece. Mm -hmm. All right. Let's go to the uh, phone lines. You're on the uh, Lou Gentilly Show. Who am I speaking with? Hi. My name is Mike. I'm calling from Massachusetts. Yes. Hi, Mike. What's your question for George Lutz? Well, George, um, apparently you appeared on In Search of in 1979, and you said uh, in regards to the haunting that for us it is over. Now, you went on to release further book sequels. And you say that the evil apparently followed you across the country. <clears throat> Excuse me. Do you have an explanation for that statement, George? I'm not sure I understand what the question is. Why did you say in In Search Of that the haunting was over? As I recall that show today, that, that time, that moment when we had been asked what it was like for us then. I was in uh, La Costa, California when that show was done. Um... In our minds, it was over. It wasn't. Nothing was the same or as bad or anything near what it had been like in in California. I'm sorry, in New York earlier. Um, but you we always said looked at it that there was a. We came to believe, that, and we've always looked at it since that there was always a half life to this. Um, sort of like as time went on. Um, the attachment to it all, either psychologically or emotionally, would remove itself and, and would become less and less. That doesn't mean that um, even today the memory of it doesn't affect us in some way. Um, it will always color the, uh, the experience in the house will always color how we think of certain things or how we approach certain things in our lives. It's not something you just throw a switch off with, but it, nowhere, no way at that time was it anywhere near um, what it had been earlier. I'd like to also add to that, what you got to remember, Mike, is with situations like this, once any individuals, not just necessarily uh, Kathy and George, once they left that home, you have a situation where things, like George was saying, they changed, they quieted down. Uh, a lot of people will experience this. But you have to also remember that within, you know, uh, any length of time, it could be two weeks, it could be two months, two years, something can kick things back up again. So probably, you know, in, in a statement when somebody says, because I've heard other people do the same thing, it's over. Well, at that point in time, you know, uh, 28 some odd years ago, it could have been a situation where everything was extremely quiet at that point. And well, one good example of that would be June 22nd in 1979. Um, I'm sorry, I think it was a little bit earlier than that. It was June 19th. June 19th, 1979 was the day that we took the um, polygraph test. 
that same day was the day that we did the um, TV show with Jim Brolin and the, uh, I'm sorry, my memory is failing me tonight. Um, I haven't thought of this for quite a while. Uh, we did a TV show that um, Rod Steiger was on. And we were asked early on in the show how things were for us now. And um, Kathy's response was fine, much better. Um, things are okay now. Um, and yet when Rod Steiger spent some time with her, he looked at her and said, you're still frightened by all this. And Kathy was very reluctant to admit that. That's not the kind of thing that you even want to give credibility to, the idea that um, yeah, there's still a part of this that there's still a part of this that um, is, is is able to bother you or to reach into you um, emotionally and 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 you don't want to admit it, but um, Rod Steiger saw it in her right away. Okay, can I ask another question, George? Sure. Now, your book, Amityville, the final chapter, this is one of the series that you wrote after the original book. I believe that was with John G. Jones. I didn't write them. John Jones wrote them. You didn't write them? No. But your name appears on the copyright, so I'm yes, somewhat that's confused. Correct. I licensed is that the those. Actu- is it an accurate representation of your story, or is it fictionalized? They mm-hmm. were to be. They were originally supposed to be published as fiction based on fact. They were not supposed to be published as nonfiction. I'm not sure how some of those um, did end up as being published as um, nonfiction. Okay, so your name was on the copyright, but he That's was correct. just using your name That's as right. artistic license. Or did you receive any profits from these books? We um, received no accountings of ever of, of any of those books, and no royalties on any of those books. Um, we did receive on some of them, and not all of them. We did receive advances on some of them. The advances, I believe, total less than eight thousand dollars. Okay. okay. All right, Mike. Thanks for the call. Thank you very much. Good, right. night. Good night. Good night. Toll free eight 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 seven 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 eight four eight eight. That's toll free eight 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 seven 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 eight four eight eight. We're speaking tonight with George Lutz and John Zaffis. Um, George, do you think a lot of what surrounds Amityville uh, is what's written in these books? I mean, a lot of these, a lot of people look at the books as being 100% die-hard, you know, fact. And, and, I mean, is that a misconception of people, that, they're, that they're, they're using that as a basis to say that Amityville could possibly be a, a hoax? Well, I think Roxanne Kaplan, um, for all of the incredibly terrible things she's had to say, said something um, rather intelligent, that is when you buy something that says it's nonfiction, then it ought to be. Um, but with any book, if you're not the writer... And I take I personally take responsibility for the contents of, of Amityville Horror, just as Kathy does. But we didn't write the book, and we understand the conditions that Anson was, was in to, to put the book together. We had the opportunity to do corrections on the galley sheets. Um, what most people don't understand is that we didn't even have a contract for that book signed until, I believe it was the end of September, early October of 1977. So we had been away from New York over a year and a half at that point. Um, the, the corrections we did, most of them were put into the book. Um, then more corrections were needed. Um, Father Ray... Uh, evidently got, got corrections and changes put into the books also on his own. I was not aware of some of the things that he had suffered and some of the things that Anson was putting in until Anson had actually written the, the book and sent out the galleys. Uh, Prentice Hall had sent the galleys out to us to look through. And I assumed, and I should not have, but I actually assumed that uh, if Anson wrote this, and I knew he had met with Father Ray, one of the conditions for him to write the book or to consider it was that Father Ray would be willing to sit down with him and, and talk with him about what he had experienced and his point of view about it all. Um, I just assumed that all of that was done with permission and with um, Father Ray's blessing, and evidently there were some things in there that, that caused all kinds of problems for him with the church. Um, 
There were things that Hansen had been told in uh, on a confidential basis and in privacy, and um, were not supposed to be in that book. Uh, I was not privy to those conversations. I was in California at the time. It doesn't excuse my involvement or, or my responsibility for ultimately for how the book came out, but I understand the process of how some of the things that got in there did. The bigger problems I've always thought came about with the movies. Um, Kathy and I did a, managed to do a, a rather extraordinary thing, and that was that we ended up with the sequel rights the right to tell any future stories about what happened to us after the movie rights were sold to American International Pictures. Most people never find themselves in a position where they um, have to deal with a movie company and their lawyers and all, and all of the contracts that are involved with that, but um, what happened in our case was that we had an agreement with Anson that if Anson did not dispose of the movie rights within a certain period of time, then they would be ours to dispose of. Well, um, Anson sold the rights to CBS. He didn't ask us whether we wanted that to happen or not. He just went ahead and did it. AIP found out about that, and they tried to get the rights from CBS, and they put together a deal with them so that they could then do the movie. Then they came to us and sent us contracts and said, um, we're going to do your movie. And we said, well, um, that's very nice, but you don't have a contract with us, and you don't really have a problem if you try to do that. That became a very messy situation. It was quite intense, um, very costly with a whole bunch of lawyers. In that process alone, we learned a great deal. And one of the things we um, got as a result of that mess and the pressure that was put on Anson to complete his part of the contract, which he had signed, was we got assigned to us, released to us, all of the sequel rights, all subsequent ability to tell the story or to have any um, commercial involvement, if you will. Uh, with the Amityville Horror. So then that that came back to Kathy and I, and that never happens. That's not the kind of thing that um, that they ever give back or they let you do. Well, we then took the money from that we got from that movie. We had no control over what they did with the with the movie in, in terms of um, creative control. We couldn't tell them, no, the walls didn't bleed. You know, you could tell them the walls didn't bleed, but um, they are still going to do it their way. No, there wasn't a black pit like that in the, in the basement, but they're still going to do the movie whatever they want. Mm -hmm. Well, in that process, um, the movie was successful. We got paid. Um, we spent the money that we made from the book and from the movie to go back and interview all the other people that had helped us and been involved with us while we were in the house and afterwards. And we um, interviewed them, and we, we got affidavits of their stories, and we were going to do a, a sequel uh, to the Amityville Horror, since we owned the rights. We are going to do a second book, absolutely nonfiction, do it our way with no other... Um, no one else to say no. You got to do it this way or the, or you know, whatever. So we thought we really had control all over all of that. Um, we hired a writer to work for us. He wrote a book tentatively called Campaign of Terror. Um, one day we went down to see him, and he had taken the furniture and all of our materials and and moved back to New Jersey. Um, so we had to start over, and. In the process of starting over, we found another um, writer to work with, and, and that one didn't work out, and eventually John Jones came along. Um, John wrote a book. Um, it was going to be called Amityville Horror 2. When he did that, um, at that point, that book was ready to come out, and... You know, DeLorenis put out a movie called Amityville Horror 2, which they eventually changed to Amityville 2 and did it without our permission, and that became a 12-, 13-year lawsuit. 
So even if you have the rights, even if you're trying to do this the best way you possibly can and, and fix the stuff that's been wrong or been said wrong, um, things will come along and, and keep you from doing that. George, do you have uh, a little bit of time? Sure. Okay, because I, I have to take a short break, and I know the, the lines are lit, so I gotta, I'm got i going to take a short break. And, uh, John, you have some time? Yep. Okay. As well as John Zaffis, who will also be joining us tomorrow night. And uh, let's take a call. Caller, uh, what's your name? This is Kevin. Okay, and what's your question for George? I was just wondering, um, you were talking earlier earlier before about the, the sounds that you're hearing, like the thumps and stuff. If there was actually any um, recordings um, taken of the sounds. George? Yes, hi. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, go ahead, ask that question again, Kevin. Um, I was wondering, you are talking about earlier before, uh, about the sounds that you heard in the house, if there were actually any recordings made of the, the sounds. No. Okay. Does that answer your question? Yep. All right, thanks. Bye-bye. 888-777-8488. That's toll-free, 888-777-8488. Speak with George Lutz. We also have John Zaffis here. Um, John, wh why do you think that, that this particular house was so accelerated into into driving these people out of it Lou, i think it was a combination of different things i, I think it had a, a tremendous amount to do with uh the tragedies that transpired in the house i think when uh kathy and uh george uh had purchased the home uh, i feel that there was some residual things that were tied in and it was, you know, just sitting there waiting to be tapped into. Do we know if somebody else purchased the house that they might have had the same type of experiences? No, we don't know that. But George and Kathy had uh, purchased it, and they were basically the victims to the Amityville home. So I feel that the intensity of what was built up in there from the prior experiences just escalated, and George and Kathy were just there, you know, unfortunately at the right time for what was bottled up there to really let loose. Hmm. And it just actually played out. Lou, you know as well as I do that a lot of times in these situations, you always hear that there are certain individuals that are attracted to certain homes. And you'll always hear, gee, I have to have this home. This home is perfect. And a lot of times it's what we refer to as actually being set up by the demonic. And it's a whole string of events that take place and unfold as it's going. And basically I feel this is what had happened to them. Now, George, you know, I'm sure that there have been, you know, a lot of people that – you know, bring up this thing about, you know, Amityville being a hoax and whatnot. What what do you say to I've, the... I've never heard such a thing. <laughs> oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> 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 All right, whatever. <laughs> um, but, I mean, what, what do you say to those people? I mean, what, what you know, I, I mean, I can understand where you're coming from, and I'm sure John can too, because there's, there's people that call me up from hotels as well as they've called John up from hotels that are going through... You know, somewhat of the same kind of situation, but not as accelerated as it, as it was with you. But, you know, what what could you tell these people that that say, "Well, Amityville was a hoax"? I don't care what you say. I, I don't have a. a I mean, it, I an mean, it, answer for such a statement. I I know what I lived through. I know what we went through as a family. I know what the people that went through the tried to help us. Um, one example that comes to mind is, is Mary Pascarella. Uh, she was so affected by the March 6, 1976 investigation that um, she went home. She closed up her Psychical Research Institute in Connecticut. She, Her husband quit his job or lost his job, I'm, I'm not sure which, um, and she moved to Florida. She was so moved by that one night there and so affected by what went on for her afterwards that it literally uprooted her life and, and changed it. 
<laughs> in ways that I wish I could undo and, and can't. Um, we know what happened to us, but that doesn't mean that um, because we tell our story that we expect everyone to just accept it. Mm -hmm. um, I would never have accepted such a thing myself before this. So it doesn't doesn't really matter what other people think. You know what you I mean, want to do. It's not that it doesn't matter. It's it's that we made the choice to try to explain what happened to us. Um, that was a free will choice. But no one's under the obligation to accept every word of it or or to believe us just because we say so. Mm -hmm. That so, would not be reasonable on our part at all. No. 888-777-8488. That's toll-free, 888-777-8488. Um, what do you think was in the house? What do you personally think was in the house? I'll go back to a little bit of what John was saying. Um, most people don't realize that the family before us um, that was so tragically murdered there, they, uh, they had gone and put statues up of the Holy Family and built a grotto in the back um, to the Blessed Virgin. And the front of the house had these statues uh, that they had gone and, and had bases built for. And, and when we saw the house, those were still there. We asked that those be taken down, and they were before we uh, moved into the house. Um, those were just put up before the murders. Hmm. The if we, if we hadn't had the house blessed, um, I don't know how things would have turned out or what would have happened. So, in other words, you think that it was because of the house blessing you may have provoked something? One of the things we did with yes, I do, and and. That's always been something that I just can't get around. I, I've always thought that that was something that triggered, challenged whatever was there um, at that point and made it change things. But that's never been the people of people that have owned the house have always spoken of it in terms, and we did, in terms of loving the house um, with this great deal of enthusiasm and passion. We love this house. Well, um, we were so happy to get that house. We really wanted to live there. There was such a desire on our part to um, to move in and, and be a family there. And we um, didn't want to leave it. We didn't want to go out. Um, we found ourselves inviting people over instead of going out to, to see people while we were there. Um, sure, part of that was the excitement of having a new house and wanting to invite people over to see it. And, uh, but the, the end result when we looked at it later uh, was that once you got in there, you didn't want to leave. You didn't want to go out. You didn't want to leave the house. You wanted to stay right there. It was just something so attractive to it. It was, it was charming, as the way that Kathy would describe it. It was just a charm to it. And it, it was such an attraction, so overwhelming, that um, you become protective of it in a sense. You wouldn't want anybody to say anything bad about it or to think anything bad about it. Um, I don't know that that makes a whole lot of sense, but when you look back at the history of different people that have lived there, um, there are no happy marriages in that house except um, the, the Cromarties uh, we got, eventually got divorced. They bought the house after we did, after we gave it back to the bank. Um, the O'Neills that moved in after the Cromarties, uh, they lost their business and um, became uh, divorced, is my understanding. And I may be wrong about the divorce part, but I know they lost their business. So money has always been a, a problem there. Um, the original builders of the house, the Monahans, it's my understanding that both of them died there, but under natural conditions. And then the Fitzgeralds that moved in after them were divorced and had money problems. Um, the Rileys who moved in after the Fitzgeralds were divorced, and the DeFeos were murdered. Um, 
it, this is a house that I consider, personally, I consider divorce a tragedy, and Kathy and I were divorced as well. Um, so when you look back at the the history of since the house has been was built, um, this has not been a place that people could say, "Oh yeah, when I lived there, I was just playing great. You know, life was wonderful." What does all that mean? I don't know. Um, but it there's an awful lot of divorces for one house. Mm-hmm. Well, what's interesting about that, George, is. Uh, when uh, doing the research, doing research like I do and being involved with so many different cases and hearing you explain what I've heard many, many times from other people that have purchased homes, that once they started checking into the uh, different uh, families that had purchased these properties, they ended up with financial devastation. They all ended up in divorces. And this is family after family after family. So you have certain houses that have what we call a bad aura to it also, where these things just keep occurring, and they keep happening to each family that moves into the home. So it's not unusual to hear just how you described the history of what some of the individuals went through with that particular home. Well, that makes sense, John. Yes, Yes, Lou, I, I've heard it time and time again where they, they'll say, you know, we've heard different things, we thought different things, you know, hearing from what people would tell us, but they don't feel that it would have affected them. But like I said, there are certain types of homes that have a very bad aura to them, and sometimes people are drawn to them just like Kathy and George were drawn to that particular home. Well, we moved in there. My business was fine. Um, my grandfather had established the business in 1906, and my dad had worked it um, until he died, and then I took it over. Mm-hmm. The uh, business was fine. Yeah. We had credit to go to one bank and say, we'd like a mortgage for this, and they gave us a, a mortgage. Um, I had two virtually brand-new boats and, and what I wanted. Um and I don't know how many cars I owned then. I think it was at least five. The What happened in that 28 days with my finances was extraordinary. Um, Gabby's brother was going to get married, and the money was lost. Um, we don't know. We don't, we don't blame that on the house. It was just another thing that happened during that time. We went to go pay the, um, he went to go pay the caterer, and he didn't have the cash that he had at the house before we went to the pay the caterer, so I had to write um, two post-dated checks to pay the caterer for that, and that came at a bad time. Um, that was Christmas time and just moving into a new house and, and all of that, but we had sold two homes that were valued at more than the cost of that house. We had um, got rid of the two mortgages there, and we had... Uh, save the money that we were spending on the, the boat storage. So financially, it should have been a breeze. And yet in that 28 days, my business, um, which was a land surveying business, civil engineering land surveying was what we were licensed to do, um, it, it slacked off to the point where it was very, very slow, um, which was not unusual for the, the winter in New York. But it was more severe than than it should have been, or should have been expected. Would have been normal for it to happen. Um, I had an audit by the IRS that uh, was just one of those things that happened during that time. I, I don't remember what it actually cost me to get rid of the, the um, fine that we had to pay or the deficiency, but it was less than a thousand dollars. I mean, it wasn't a a big deal load up, but it was just one of those things that was a pressure that came up during that time. Um, yeah, the finances changed, and then we left there, and things got better, and they continued to get better. Um, living at Cavie's mom's house, um, even though all our things were in that house, um, we went out and I bought a. Uh, we got rid of the van that we had had there, and I bought another car, um, and. Then my grandfather had died, and 
the furniture that he that, um, that estate did not want, then we were given that, and we took that some of that furniture with us to California, so we had some furniture to take with us. We left everything there. It was eventually auctioned off. We didn't go back for the any of the things that we had there. Some friends of ours did go in on um, Easter Sunday and get some personal papers out and a chest that I still have that my grandfather had made. Um, but otherwise, everything else was left there, including the boats, and then that was all auctioned off. All right, George, I want to uh, I want to save the rest of this for tomorrow night as well sure. as John um, because I got I got so many emails here and I, I don't want to really go to the to the phone lines while we're discussing that. But uh, I want to what I want to do is is I want to I want to leave off there. We'll come back tomorrow night. We'll speak with Lorraine and we'll go into more detail uh, about everything about how they investigated it and and how uh, you know you got involved with with Ed and Lorraine. And uh, we can talk a little bit about uh, Kaplan and, and, and things like that. Um, Stephen Kaplan. <laughs> hey, yeah, I know. <laughs> but uh, anyway, and, and John, same thing. Um, but I, I, I want to wrap it up because I do have to get out of here. Um, so I want to thank you, George, for the uh, for the honor of, of coming on and, and oh, talking about welcome, this. You're quite welcome, Lou. I'm glad to have had the opportunity to, to be on your show and, uh, and speak about these things. And, and I appreciate very much the way you've let me rattle on at times. Well, uh, you know, I, I think people need to hear the George Lutz. I, I mean, what I'm hearing is somebody who is is still emotional about this thing. It's not like you're just talking about it like you're sensationalizing. You you can tell that there's something there that, that it's it's emotional. It's attached to it. You know what I mean? That it's it's difficult to go through and talk about it again. And I, and I, I do thank you for, you know, There's, there's real reasons forward. why I don't do this. Well, I, I can understand that. You know, and, John, I think you can sense that as well. Absolutely, you know, and for what Absolutely. they went for what they went through, you know, I, I I don't blame you, George. I have to agree. I can definitely hear sincerity in your voice when you yeah. talk about this. You know. all right. Well, I want to thank you very much, George and John, for being on the show, and uh, I will speak with both of you tomorrow night, ten o'clock Eastern Standard Time. Okay. All right. Okay. Have a good, good night. night. All right. Good night, guys. Bye bye. All right. Bye bye. Okay. Yeah, I had I had to end it because I, I have. There's so many emails here and, and, and stuff. I, I can't, you know, and plus i got to get out of here anyway. But uh, I will get your emails answered. I mean, there's just so many that I, I don't even know where to, to begin. So what we're going to do is we're going to sort through a lot of these emails. And, uh, you know, I, I know a lot of people uh, have been watching the, the phone lines ringing off the hook here. But, you know, when, when George and, and John, they start talking about it, you know, I don't like to break in. It's only at certain times. So uh, we will be here tomorrow night, uh, Tuesday, 10 o'clock Eastern Standard Time, when we'll be speaking more with George Lutz, who is the actual person who lived inside of the Amityville house uh, for 28 days until their family, his family fled in fear uh, from what was inside of the house. And uh, we'll find out what really happened at 112 Ocean Avenue. And uh, we're slowly but surely uncovering the truth at 112 Ocean Avenue. And, you know, some of the listeners brought up some good points. But I, I think, you know, you have to look at this thing as if you believe in the paranormal and you believe in ghosts, you know, a lot of these hauntings that do happen to people, they are, you know, pretty much common. And what the Lutzes went through sounded in the beginning like it was a like it was a haunting. And, you know, it just accelerated and it was uncommon for it to accelerate the way it did. But that doesn't mean that it 100 percent did not happen. So uh, with that, I want to leave everybody, so tune in tonight, 10 o'clock Eastern Standard Time, when we speak more with Lorraine Warren, George Lutz, and John Zaffis. Good night, everyone, and God bless.